Welcome to 101. I'm Greg Bassett, your host from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper. It's a big day here at Pac-14. They're all big, but we've got one of the stars of Pac-14 in the house in a completely different role. Lieutenant Tim Robinson is here today as Professor Tim Robinson. Welcome, sir. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me on the show this week. Well, everyone knows you from Crime Solvers. You're like the star of the 12 o'clock hour. Yes. You're on Pac-14 every day. Um, and just compelling to watch. I, I never miss it. I look forward to the new version every week. It's always great. Well, thank you. Um, but you're also a professor adjunct at Salisbury University, yes. and we want to talk about some history today. That's awesome. I've been doing it since 2009. I feel fortunate because I treat history almost like a hobby to me. I love reading history. I love talking about history. I love watching documentaries. Uh, matter of fact, I always like um, watching TV in bed and I always like watching the documentaries from the History Channel. And it took me uh, four nights to finally finish watching um, the most recent episode of the, uh, the Food That Made America because I kept falling asleep. It, it's a passion for me. It, yeah. it really interests me. And I really enjoy having the opportunity to share it with uh, the young college kids today. Well, the class you're teaching this semester uh, is, uh, what, History 201? Yeah, which History is 201. Which everything is, up to 1865. Yeah, everything up to the arrival of the first colonists. Um, I start with the failure at Roanoke and right. to their ultimate success at Jamestown, all the way up through to how they go from being happy British subjects to no longer being happy <laughs> British subjects and why that happens and the steps they take. And, they actually, in the steps they take first, try to repair that relationship, and then they realize that relationship is no longer repairable and led us to the Declaration of Independence, the Revolutionary War. Matter of fact, I just finished uh, lecturing last night on the Revolutionary War, and one of the things, one of my favorite things to talk about in the Revolutionary War is I always, always give my students a lecture on Benedict Arnold because I always ask them, What's, when I say the name Benedict, Benedict Arnold, what's the first thing that comes to mind? I always have a couple of kids, always traitor. And then I always love telling them, it says, would it surprise you if you knew he was one of America's first military heroes? Yeah. I mean, this guy's a hero of the, of the Battle of Fort Ticonderoga. He is a hero of the Battle of Saratoga. Both had um, huge impacts on the American Revolutionary Movement. And then he goes and, and does what he does. And he sells out. He's one of America's greatest military heroes sold out to the British. He sells but, out to the British. But and it was a very complicated decision on his part. And there were many people who could understand why he did what he did. Um, I, I almost think it was a little selfish on his part, too. I think it was more than just money. I, it wasn't just the money aspect of it. I think he felt slighted. I think he felt slighted that he felt like people kept um, looking down on him, weren't giving him the recognition that he was due. And he had a little hiccup. He got in trouble in Philadelphia. He got court-martialed for something. And the, the penalty was a reprimand, a personal reprimand by George Washington, who we believed he was close to. And we heard the words applied to him, like imprudent, reprehensible. That, that pushed him uh, right. over the edge. Right. Um, then I like continuing on to the formation of our country and how we're lucky we didn't break apart during the Articles of Confederation and how they decided and why they decided to go back and try to fix the articles. Next thing you know, they came out with this whole new document. Right. And led us to the Bill of Rights, which led us into the 19th century, the technological advances as our, as our country develops. But at the same time, you had a huge elephant in the room. Slavery. Slavery, exactly, which, which, was, which the founding fathers did not deal with. Because you look at the Constitution, slavery is not mentioned er anywhere. They would use other terms like those not free. Right. They could not bring themselves to use the word slavery. And the closest the Founding Fathers did to doing anything with it was they passed an importation ban that wouldn't go into effect for 20 years. And they kept kicking that uh, can down the road for the next generation, and when it finally got to the point where it's dealt with after a series of band-aids, like the uh, Missouri Compromise and the Kansas-Nebraska uh, Act and the Compromise of 1850, then it led us to uh, Fort Sumter and the Civil War. That right. was a pretty bad day when that happened and right. our country kind of fell apart. And we're frankly lucky that our country survived that. And we actually came out of the Civil War, I think, the United States much stronger, reborn, 
and getting ready to take uh, our place on the world scene. Kansas, Nebraska, the Missouri Compromise. Henry Clay was yeah. kind of a hero of mine because he was such a great legislator. Yeah, Henry Clay, if I, Henry Clay is probably the most important politician of the 19th century Absolutely. who never became president. Ran six times, I yeah, think, he, uh, as he, a Whig. He yeah, he, yeah. Well, he, ran as, he ran as a Whig. He also ran, uh, I think at one point, he ran a, on a national Republican, on, on the national Republican ticket before they became the Whig Party. But if he had run again when they ran James K. Polk, right? when they ran James K. Polk in um, 1840 against Martin Van Buren, who right. they had nicknamed Martin Van Ru his nickname was Martin Van Ruin, right. because he had the bad luck of overseeing a disastrous economy. If they had run him in 1840, uh, he, w he would have been elected in 1840 instead of James. Anybody could have beat Martin Van Buren in 1840. Right. It was so complicated, that question of expanding slavery to the mm -hmm. West. And we just kind of went from War of 1812 right into 1865. Yeah. It, it was a big problem because, and there's actually some people that looked at the expansion of America and things like the Mexican-American War that James Polk had, uh, James Polk had a, um, um, a, um, and I, realized, I just realized I misspoke with the 1840 election. It wasn't James Polk, it was William Henry Harrison. Right. It was William Henry Harrison that ran against him. But James K. Polk was uh, 18, uh, um, later on, 1844. And when James K. Polk um, was one at the helm when we had the uh, Mexican-American War, and we took in a lot of the American uh, Southwest. Right. We took a lot of the American Southwest. And a lot of people saw that as a, a giant conspiracy right. to expand the slave power. So, very interesting, interesting time period. Right. A lot of dynamics, and it became when you look at the 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 problems that we're dealing with today, whether it's you know Second Amendment, ab abortion, uh, social justice issues. You can wrap all those together, and still not realizing just how big the uh, abolition and slavery movement was leading up to the Civil War. Right, but without training in the '40s and '50s, you don't see the formation, the thinking of all of Abraham Lincoln, who ends up being our greatest president. Yes. You know, and saves the country. And he was he was a political genius when when he ran in 1860. This this was the genius of him when he ran in 1860. I mean, he, he was he was already a politician. He was sort of known. He's the guy's experience was a, one single term as a house a house member as a member of Congress. Uh, he did run for Senate in 1856, but he lost against Stephen Douglas, Douglas. Stephen Douglas. But his genius was when they, when they go to the 1860 um, uh, convention, and conventions were a fairly new thing. They hadn't been around for very long, and they could not they could not agree on one candidate on a consensus candidate. So because they, they didn't have the primaries that we have today, his handlers had managed to get everybody to say, "Okay, well, if your favorite son doesn't get the nomination, he was number two yep, on everybody's list." He was list. number exactly. <laughs> you've read the same book. Oh I, no, I've okay. I've, I've studied. You've, this re, to you've death. read Doris Goodwin's book. That book is. I've read every he word. Was Doris two, Goodwin. Was number, has, yeah, has he written. was number yeah. two. He, every, yeah. he got everybody to select him as their number two candidate. Yes, that's exactly what he did. And next thing you know, he becomes a candidate. But even though the primary classes I teach are early America, I have a passion for history. I love the Teddy Roosevelt period. I love the World War period, the First World War and the Second World War, and I have a weird fascination too with the uh, manned space program. I always, I grew up during the, at the tail end, at the end of the Apollo era, and it's, in the, I, I got to watch the development of the space shuttle, and I've always been fascinated by that time period. Well, this time of year is interesting because there's so many great space manned space mm -hmm. flight anniversaries. From the Challenger in '86 yeah. was a January event. Uh, the Apollo One the day fire. before that, the Apollo One fire was yes. uh, was also the, in yes. that time of year, mm -hmm. and I think the last time we landed on the moon was it fifty years ago now? With Apollo Seventeen was also this time of year. Yeah, it was. It was it's, that's going to be uh, December of nineteen seventy two. Okay, so it'll be December twenty twenty two. We'll have that okay. anniversary, and also you know talking about the fiftieth anniversary of the landing on the moon. I actually um, made the trek to Washington D.C. that day. On the, on the 50th anniversary, wow. so I was part of that celebration and uh, walking on the mall on the 50th day on July 20th, um, uh, 2019. Wow! Uh, toward the Air and Space Museum, they had put a Neil Armstrong spacesuit back on display. Took my son, and we had, we had a great time that day. But I was just addicted to mm -hmm. um, all the space program stuff because it was the centerpiece of our lives for so mm -hmm. long. If we do not have the Russians breathing down our necks, yeah, 
in the 1960s, we would not have gotten to the moon as quick as we did. We would have gotten there eventually. But, I mean, they had, they had 400,000 people working seven days a week, 24 hours a, a day to get this accomplished. Money was no object back then. The only mission was, let's beat the Soviets to the moon. And it was coming down to the wire. And a lot of people don't realize that or don't believe that it was. If the Russians, they were working on their own moon rocket too. The problem was it just wasn't as reliable as the Saturn V. Yeah. They actually got a, a man, uh, unmanned rover there, I yes. think, even before we landed with men. So they did, it was, they, yeah. but they, they could not get the, their heavy lift rocket, the N1 rocket, kept blowing up. Right. I want to talk real quick about something that obsesses me, and I just wonder if you're the same way. I love going to locations in history, imagining that like the whole focus of the world was on this spot, and I'm there now. So I know you had some of those experiences when you spent your semester abroad. Yes. You were in Germany, and you actually went to a concentration camp, which I've never done anything like that. Yes, and um, one of the most fortunate things that I ever did was when I was an undergraduate, I was able to do a semester in Europe. And the whole focus of my travels was studying World War II. It was called World War II, A Closer Look, and I spent time in England, France, Germany, Holland, and Belgium, and because of a wrong turn on the Autobahn, we almost saw Poland before we realized <laughs> we got the bus we were on. It's just, that, was, that was a whole funny story, but you know, I got to see stuff, and you talk about firsthand. I saw museums in London, been to the Imperial War Museum, which is a fabulous place. It's Smithsonian quality, all about uh, British military history, and one thing is, I was, as, a, as a young college student, I never realized just how many Americans were buried over there. And this is pre-internet, and, and yeah. until I saw it with my own eyes. Yeah. And it totally opened my eyes to how many Americans have never returned. I went to the cemeteries at Cambridge, and I was fortunate to go to the cemetery in Normandy. Uh, I stood on the exact beaches. I went to both Omaha Beach, and I went to Utah Beach. I stood on the same beaches where on June 6, 1944, the American soldiers stormed Fortress Europe. And But you mentioned the concentration camp. when. When I was in Europe, when I was in Germany, I was in Berlin, we went to Sachsenhausen, which is out, located outside of Berlin, and I was brought on a tour of that camp by a survivor of that camp. And this was in the early 90s, so there were still a lot of, a lot of these individuals still alive. And you cannot get that from watching a documentary to reading a book. And we're being shown around on a private tour by a survivor of that camp, somebody That's who had incredible. been there as a child. That's incredible. Yes. And the Anne Frank House, you were the there? Yes, I was in the Amsterdam. That was, that was something else. That's uh, life-changing. That was the Amf in Amsterdam. I really enjoyed Amsterdam. And I got to tell you another story I never got to. Uh, we went to Wannsee, Germany, which is outside of Berlin. And I never forgot the feeling that I got. Wannsee, uh, if you're not familiar, that's where Adolf Hitler and his henchmen came up with the a final solution where they decided they were going to exterminate the Jews. Oh, and that room where they that made room, that decision. That, when they yeah. made the decision at conference yeah. room, I, I'll never forget the feeling of being in that same room where Hitler and his henchmen made that decision. The feeling of, I was in the presence of the worst evil that humanity has ever seen. Perhaps the most evil decision verdict ever, ever made. Ever made in humankind. Yeah. It was just... It, it was probably the most powerful experiences I, as a 21-year-old college student, could have ever had. But what I see now is that so many people are not like us in that degree. They, mm -hmm. they either accept, like me with Kent State, mm -hmm. not learning more about it and experiencing and realizing what's going on. Anne Frank, you know, they used to make us read the Anne Frank diaries, and I used to roll my eyes. Mm -hmm. But then when you, you, you know, once you learn more and you realize mm -hmm. this is an amazing mm -hmm. thing that this girl yeah. did, you know, hiding people in the attic, the whole... Thing is just incredible yes. to me, and I just experienced so many through, people yes. who don't understand mm -hmm. history, no. and they've got opinions about politics that are based on flawed history. It just makes me insane. And a lot of people don't understand. This is what gets me. Is that I, I hear this a lot on the news about how polarized we are as a society right now. It's the most polarized we've never been in the situation before. He says, well, you know what? First off, I can talk to you about the Civil War. <laughs> Look at you the, don't 18, give... the 1800 J Jefferson Adams election. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, my you, gosh. Oh, that gosh. Yeah. And, and um, there, there's a site that I find I share with my students. It's like, if they had TV commercials yeah. during the 1800 <laughs> yeah. uh, election. Some, and they were and, two of the greatest Americans in yeah. history, and they were still each other's throats, and they had they been were, best friends for years. They were, and, and they had a major falling out, yeah. but it's real. But one of the neatest stories is about how they rekindled their friendship right. at the end. And 
or then even talk about the American Revolution itself. With, with the loyalists, a lot of Americans don't realize the sheer number of Americans that fought on the side of the British and the loyalist militias to put down the revolution. And then what happened to the loyalists? The loyalists had to abandon their properties, had to abandon their, um, never, they never were able to return. And so you talk about, so we've, we've had many incidences you now throughout our human experience here in the, in the United States where we have been very Polaroid. But I love talking about that story of uh, Adams and Jefferson. Again, they went from being two people that had the most to do probably arguably with pushing the Declaration of Independence through. Adams was the Atlas of Independence, Jefferson said. There's yeah, just no and, doubt about and, it. And Jefferson, and, and a lot of people don't realize, Jefferson was a very shy man. He hated speaking in public. He yeah. was very awkward speaking, but he had a gift for the written word. He could write. He could, that mm -hmm. Declaration of Independence, the words that he chose, mm -hmm. many of them stolen, but, but, yeah. but they're his words, yeah. um, just really encapsulated everything that everyone was thinking at the time. And do you know the story about how um, their lives ended? Yeah, they that died be, on the same day. Oh my! And what are the first? What are the odds? Fifty of that? years. Well, <laughs> Fifty they, years. They, they, had, they had rekindled their relationship, <laughs> yeah. and and um, John Adams dies. He, he breathes his last, and John Adams' last words on July fourth, eighteen twenty six, is. Jefferson survives. Right. Those were his last words. He had no way of knowing that Jefferson died that morning. Right. And if that doesn't, you know, say anything about, you know, the destiny of America, that the two most influential individuals both died same day, 50th anniversary, then, then nothing will. And then Adam's son, who also doesn't get credit in history, Adams being a one-term president, mm -hmm. John Quincy Adams being a one-term president, losing to the, I think, despicable Andrew Jackson. I don't know how you feel about him. But John Quincy Adams was certainly our smartest president, by, but he was the most oh, traveled man in the world he, at the time. You talk about a guy who was born to be president. He from was day trained. One. His he was father trained by and his mother father. trained him to be a, a great leader. And his experience in foreign policy. He's also one of our best secretaries of state. He was the, the best, best secretary of state we probably ever had Monroe throughout Doctrine. the 19th century, yes. Yeah. But he, he, was a, he was a victim of politics. Like anything else, politics is a strange animal. And Andrew Jackson is, he was an interesting individual. The one thing I will give Andrew Jackson is he changed the model of the presidency because prior to him, most presidents saw themselves as a caretaker to make sure the ship is being navigated or steered yeah. the right way. And, and he got off the porch and ran with the and, dogs. Yeah, well, he got over there. So he, he, took, he took the bull by the horns. And one thing I always thought yeah. was interesting is in his two terms, he issues more vetoes than all his predecessors combined. All his predecessors combined. And Thomas Jefferson didn't veto a single bill during yeah. his, his two terms. Because most, most of the preceding presidents only would issue a veto if they thought it was against the Constitution, you know, with, without any regard to policy. See, Andrew Jackson comes in, he goes, I don't like that policy. I'm vetoing it because I disagree with it. So he's the first president to start doing that. He changes and makes the modern model of president. And you know um, his nickname, or what his nickname did to forever um, change the uh, course of the logo for the Democratic Party? Old Hickory. Well, no, that, that was his nickname, but they called him a jackass. Okay. <laughs> because of his personality and the way he treated people. Right. And he took that as a badge of honor and started using the image of a jackass in his political <laughs> campaigns, and political campaign ads. And ever since that, the Democratic Party uses the symbol of the, what well, they call it the donkey, but it's really a jackass. And that's where it comes from. It comes from Andrew Jackson being described as, as that. The Bill of Rights... Uh, Kind of an afterthought, not really. It was. But, but it, it was, you know, the Constitution is done. Wait a minute, we left some stuff out. <laughs> we uh, left some stuff out. You know, to get it to get it approved. Yeah. Uh, some great people, George Mason, did not yeah. sign the Constitution. Yeah. There were a lot of people who were opposed to the Constitution. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Bill of Rights, uh, it, it's what we hang on for everything mm -hmm. in America these days. But you're correct, it was an afterthought. It, yeah, but it, it makes me crazy how there, the Bill of Rights is completely misinterpreted. Now, my whole career is based on the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand that, and I, I certainly protect all that. I used to have a, a copy of the Constitution in my office framed a, a, big, a big picture of it. Mm -hmm. And when I'd have readers come in, usually political-type leaders, who wanted to complain about, well, you, you can't write that. And I would point to him and go, that thing gives me the right to write about anything I want. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, well, you know, that would end the arguments. But it makes me crazy that people don't really understand the Constitution, don't understand the context. I know you and I probably disagree on the Second Amendment, 
But certainly Second Amendment is one of those places that I think that the Bill of Rights is being completely misconstrued. Well, and, and I'm glad you've <laughs> asked this question about the Bill of Rights because when I talk to students, when I talk to anybody, I say the first thing you've got to do when you're thinking about the Bill of Rights is put yourself in the mindset of the men who wrote this thing. You're talking about men that, that lived through the British oppression. Um, you, would be a, you would be arrested and prosecuted if you spoke out against King George III. You could be arrested or prosecuted if you published a pamphlet or a newsletter against King George III. They had an established church, the Anglican Church, which you were forced to financially contribute to, even if you weren't a member. It, it, was, it was forced upon you. Um, if you were arrested with them, um, we saw things when... Um, when they passed things like the Impartial Administration of Justice Act in the aftermath of the Boston Tea Party in Massachusetts, if you were a, if you were a colonial official, if you were even a colonist and you were charged with a serious crime, they would ship you to England for trial. Right. And if you didn't you, come back. No, and if you were <laughs> and if you were an English government official, likewise, if you were, they'd ship you to England. I mean, it's and it's they would amazing. Take your it was, money it was and your due process. Money. Yeah, guaranteeing due stuff like guaranteeing due process, the the right to you know legal representation yeah. of of being decided by your peers here, you know, of legal protections. And then we talk about the Second Amendment. Quartering troops in your yeah, house, oh, which happened in the Revolutionary War all the time. Well, that quartering, the quartering of the troops, that was also part, that was all occurred in the aftermath of the uh, Boston Tea Party. Right. With, um, they called them, Brit, uh, Britain called them the coercive acts. The colonists labeled them the intolerable acts. And that was one of the aspects where the, the British said, we got, the, we got a problem with Massachusetts. We need to bring order to Massachusetts. So we are sending the army. Oh, and guess what? <laughs> Uh, Bostonians, you got to pay for this. You got to supply them some system and all. Oh yeah, the stamp tax. Yeah, this, yeah, and it's just um, it, it was really incredible. So you look at the mindset, what they lived through to make sure something like that doesn't happen, and then all you got to do is talk about Concord and Lexington, when the British realized we have a problem on our hands and we need to neuter the the the, the power the uh, power of the colonials and prevent them from actually you know challenging us. So, and they, they weren't going out, they weren't going for the gun, they were going for their gunpowder because their gunpowder was actually scarce right. and hard to obtain back right. then. And if they could get all the gunpowder, then they could, at that point, you know, render these militias, you know, neutered. And that's what they were going for, they were going for the powder. And they get all the way to uh, Concord, where they thought it was supposed to be, and it wasn't there because the, the colonials actually had a pretty good intel network right. for their time. They knew right. the British were coming. Like the French resistance yeah. almost. And it was, um, <laughs> and so they were able to move it. And, and it was actually a disaster for the British because, I mean, April 19th, 1775 was a disaster for the British because then with, after they found it was gone, they had to march back. And you're talking about a day that was close to 24 hours long of a march for these soldiers. And they were harassed, and they were shot at from behind trees, but from behind uh, stones, ledges, um, bush. It's the colonial militias fought totally different from these soldiers marching down. The, the British fought, and the European accepted tactics. Um, they marched in formation. They fired in volleys together. Again, in the red coats, the whole reason behind the red coats was to be intimidating. Well, these militias weren't intimidated. I can tell you that they stood up for themselves. For me, the history thing, I, I just love how these great thinkers evolve in their thinking mm -hmm. um, and th like what's going on in their backgrounds that make them make decisions about leadership and, and you know, committing history. Talk about how you inspire these youngsters to learn. Well, one of the things I like doing is I give them an opportunity to almost be like many historians. So I give them the raw data the raw information. And this, I want you to take this information and I want you to almost make, be, make a conclusion from this. Let me tell you about a couple of projects I've done this semester. Right, the first project I did, I've got, a, I've got a weird interest also. I, I've got a lot of weird interests in history as you probably figure, but I've always been fascinated with um, uh, the uh, late 17th century and the period of the Salem Witch Trials. And believe it or not, there's so much documentation from that time period. Yeah, you can read the readily trial, the, accessible the trial stuff. Yes. You can read all the different and stuff. There's all said. kinds of the indictments, everything from the indictments to the examination records right. to to the testimonies. And, and so what I do is I assign. I, I actually put the students in groups and I assign them 
uh, each student or each group gets gets two witches. One of them that would have survived, where it wasn't executed, and the other one was one of the executed witches. And they have to look at these documents and they have to take on the role. Each each student in the group, one student would have the role of a prosecutor, one student would have the role of a defense attorney, and one student would have the role of a jury. And they have to use the documents. And also, they have to pretend it's also 1692. Like without, and if they were in 1692, with the information they've had, what they've learned, would they have, would, how would they have prosecuted this person? What argument would they make from what they have in, the, in these documents when they're instructing the jury? What, what argument would they make they're guilty of witchcraft? If they were a defense attorney, what would they harp on finding these documents that show it's all BS, that they're, it's crazy? Then if they get the jury, what made them think that they were guilty or not guilty? I let them you know, come to their own conclusions, and, but based on the original documents. There another project which I'm in the middle of grading. And, and by the way, you know, I love talking about history. If it wasn't for actually having to sit and grade all these papers, it would be the best job in the world. <laughs> but so, but I, I got to read, re, I'm reading these papers and I do a, like a mini biographical sketch. And again, these are records that still exist. So they have the, these old wills and inventories. And just like we would write a will in the 21st century back then, when they were sick and everybody died, they wrote a will. And when they did pass away, they would get the um, somebody would come in and, and do an inventory of all their possessions. Plus, there's all kinds of other documents and all kinds of stuff they can find in the Maryland archives. And then you have to take these original documents and try to do a little sketch of their life. A mini sketch, you know, were they rich? Were they wealthy? Were they could? He, how could you see if they were literate? Um, maybe what kind of social standing did they have in their community? What could you infer they might have done for a living? How do they make money from looking at these original documents? And I give them the original documents in the original handwriting. So they look at these things and the first thing, their eyes get all wide because it looks like it's written in a foreign language. Because here's what you have. They didn't make the letters the same way we make our letters today for many of the letters. They also didn't spell the way we spell. Right. They also used vocabulary that we would not do. Like everybody had a stilliard. So stuff like that, and, and stilliard was a way of measuring stuff. And stuff like that, they, they have no idea, even if they could translate it, what this word meant, because they don't use this vocabulary anymore. And here's the best part about it, it's in cursive, because they all wrote cursive <laughs> right, back then. Right. And so most 18, 19, with those 20 pens, old, yes. the feather pens, it made yeah. more sense. Yes, but, yeah. they all wrote cursive, yeah. and it's, it's really interesting and watching some kids are like, oh my, I can't, yes, you can do this. And let's slow down, <laughs> let's pick up. And here's the word, okay, you can figure out this, this, this is an S, okay, that's a T, that's a, it was sound, and it, it is, sometimes you gotta go word by word. Right. Or then if you figure out this half of the sentence, you're gonna take a guess what the rest of the half of the sentence says. Yeah. So. He's Professor Tim Robinson, and we're thrilled that he was here today. I would love to have him back every week. I mean, we could just do this all the time. <laughs> oh, I, I love it. I mean, anytime you want to have me back, I mean, I can go on and on. Hey, thanks for being here today. We really appreciate well, it. Well, thank you for having me. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I'm Greg Bassett from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper, another edition of One on One right here on PAC 14. First Shore Federal is proud to support PAC-14 and one-on-one. -on -one. We'd encourage every business to support PAC-14 and, and pick a program and support it and let's make a difference.